Good morning. Welcome uh, on this lovely, cool, fresh morning, which to me is a great joy. Uh, I don't like the hot weather, so I just love the freshness of the breeze. And we're gathered in the warm embrace of our Father's love, in the unity that we share through the Holy Spirit, in the, um, the connection we have in Jesus, our, our Lord and Saviour. We're his body gathered together. So we gather as this community um, of people before our God. And we bid you welcome if you're a visitor. I know there's a few visitors uh, here. I've welcomed a couple of people. And uh, if you're people that have been away and on holidays and haven't been for a while, welcome again to you and welcome to all the familiar faces. We also extend a special warm welcome to Peter, Peter Starkey, who's our guest speaker today. Um, and welcome to our wonderful band who are going to lead us in the singing a little while later. Um, we're going to uh, uh, begin uh, with some announcements and um, deal with those community things first. So Chris, do you want to hop up and do announcements? is on January the 29th so that next week we'll have worship here and the following wors worship will be at the Harvest Centre at 9am oh yeah that is very exciting is Anna here today Anna's kind of organised this in a way of course we've got the bikes going through the Santos tour down under and because on Wednesday it's going to be a beautiful day we are encouraging people to come here and do a community. This will be a great place to watch the race because um, Tananda will be chockers with people and crazies. So um, come here, bring, bring nibbles, bring something to eat and we can all sit out the front and the bell is going to be rung uh, madly apparently because the bikes are actually going past here from what I know five times. So, you know, we're, it's not like whiz and they're gone, they, they'll be back. Um, so let's come, and have, let's come and have a community event. Five whizzes. Hey? Five, five whizzes. Yeah, five whizzes. Oh, all right. And there you go. Of course, you've probably all greeted one another already. Well, we have a, we're going to have a little chat first. And come Evan back. and Annette are away on holiday. And I make an announcement that I'm not sure if um, Nevin has told everybody, but he is retiring, right, he has retired, but he got, he's on long service leave at the moment, and they're away on holidays at the moment, um, which they deserve thoroughly. She's trying to run away, and I don't want her to run away. Um, another announcement that we have that uh, Chris didn't have the notes on is that Nevin, who she's just been talking about, um, is going to open the church up on Thursday night. now. Um, it's all to do with this, this, The Wonder, which is why Peter's here, because this is a book that Peter's written. We've been promoting it uh, lately. Quite a few of you have already got it. We've got lots more copies of it down. Uh, I've got hold of them this morning if you want to um, grab a copy. But um, it is um, a wonderful book, and we're going to be kind of using the theme of The Wonder over the next few months, really, um, in our worship, but also in gatherings um, beyond... Sunday. So one of those is Thursday night. Nevin is opening the church. So if you're free at Thursday night at 7.30, it's all very informal. It's just about coming down, maybe reading a bit, maybe chatting, maybe just sitting and praying or reflecting. Um, just come along and check it out. Um, and, and if you haven't got a copy of the book, well, you know, you'll hear a bit about it um, then or else grab one now. Do you have something you wanted to say about it, Chris? Well, I've been reading the books already and I've started the Wonder Book. Um, I don't know about you, but sometimes I find my faith life is, dare I say, boring, tedious and a burden. 
and other times I feel quite uplifted. But the book, The Wander, for me is extremely uplifting and releasing and refreshing. So I just encourage you to get a book. Um, our care group will be looking at it together. I'm not sure quite how we're going to do it yet. There is sort of in small chapters. But basically what I do is go through it with a pen and I underline things I like, put an exclamation mark by something that stuns me, which is really great when that happens, and or a question mark by something that I might not agree with or I think worth a conversation. Um, and that's the way we perhaps will do it in our home group, we'll say, um, let's all read chapters so and so. And in, the, in one chapter there are about five different little parts or three little parts. So, you know, you can do it over your normal devotional time or whenever you want. Um, and then when we get together, we'll probably discuss that chapter and look at the question marks and the exclamation marks and share them with one another. If you are not in a care group, um, you could perhaps let me know and we can try and arrange some. But you know what, you can just ask your neighbours or you can ask the person sitting in the pew next to you or whoever um, to get together and have a look at it and use the book. Anyway, I encourage you to do it. It's been uplifting. I've loved it. Yeah, uh, it can be as informal as you want to make it. I, I, I was just picturing women in the congregation getting together in twos and threes or their friendship groups and, and just having coffee and having a chat about what you've just been reading in the book. And, you know, I was thinking, oh, then that, and then there'll be a real wow factor because there'll be women of wonder, won't they? All wondering and questioning. So we want a lot of wow factor in the congregation. And then I thought, well, what if the men do it? Men of wonder. Mm, sounds like hard work to me. Another one is walking. Um, last year we did some prayer walks in Lent. Lent's coming up fairly soon. Um, so uh, rather than prayer walks in Lent, maybe we'll just have some wonder walks or walking in the wonder. And um, So there's all sorts of opportunities. Um, they don't have to be formal structured groups. You can do this in just little friendship groups and all sorts of ways. So. We encourage you and we, yeah, we'd, we want to really live in the wonder over the next few months and going on from there. Anyway, enough of that. I think we have greeted one another. There was a real buzz of chat um, before we started this morning. So we'll just go into a prayer. But, um, and you can close your eyes. Um, we've all come with all this buzz of things going on in our lives. We're excited to see one another. We've gathered as God's people. Um, we've all got things in our families, things maybe in workplaces, things that are affecting us in the church and the community and the world. So just take a, a quiet little few seconds to um, just trust those into God's hands. So Heavenly Father, you know us. You're involved in our lives. Your Holy Spirit's moving amongst us. We are the body of Christ. We're connected to one another and to what goes on around us. Uh, we know that you um, are concerned about all these things. So we do trust them to you, Lord, as we come this morning. As we come to worship you, we ask that you would um, hold on to these things. Hold them close to your heart, as you always do, because that's where we are, close to your heart. So fill us with your spirit as we gather in this worship time. Lift us up in praise and worship. Open our ears, our hearts, our minds that we might draw close to you and know you more. We pray in the name of Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And we pray together the community prayer, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name.
Let's stand as we sing out this song.
Gospel reading is from Luke chapter 5, um, 17 to 32. Jesus heals a paralysed man. One day while Jesus was teaching, some Pharisees and teachers of religious law were sitting nearby. It seemed that these men showed up every, in every village all over Galilee and Judea, as well as from Jerusalem. And the Lord's healing power was strongly with Jesus. Some men came carrying a paralysed man on a sleeping mat. They tried to take him inside to Jesus, but they couldn't reach him because of the crowd. So they went up to the roof and took off some tiles. Then they lowered the sick man on the mat down into the crowd, right in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the man, Young man, your sins are forgiven. But the Pharisees and teachers of religious law said to themselves, Who does he think he is? That's blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew what they were thinking, so he asked them, Why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or stand up and walk? So I'll prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralysed man and said, Stand up, pick up your mat and go home. And immediately, as everyone watched, the man jumped up, picked up his mat and went home, praising God. Everyone was gripped with great wonder and awe, and they praised God, exclaiming, We have seen amazing things today. Later, as Jesus left the town, he saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Levi got up, left everything and followed him. Later, Levi held a banquet in his home with Jesus as the guest of honour. Many of Levi's fellow tax collectors and other guests also ate with them, but the Pharisees and the teachers of religious law complained bitterly to Jesus' disciples. Why do you eat and drink with such scum? Jesus answered them, Healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners and need to repent. This is the word of the Lord. Sometimes when we come before God, we sit there with uh, an empty mind because we're not sure what to say. And I think this, this song is special to me because uh, what it does is it's, um, it's okay. <laughs> He's there. I'm finding myself at a loss for words And the funny thing is, it's okay The last thing I need is to be heard But in the quiet, what you would say Word of God speak
I love those words, washing, washing my eyes to see you clearly. And it fits in with what I was going to pray as we hear God's word. And it's from Ephesians chapter 1 where Paul says, you know, I pray that the eyes of your heart will be opened. And so the theme for today is living in the wonder, but it's also about having the lens of wonder. You know, uh, these glasses have a lens on them. Uh, they enable you to see things clearly, things that are blurry. You know, I, I could try and read this Bible. The, the jolly print's gotten smaller over the last few years. I could try and read this Bible, but it's just a blur. But as soon as I put the lens on, it gets sharper. Now, if I was short-sighted, which means I can, uh, sorry, which means I can see shortly, but I can't see in the distance, if I put on driving glasses to try and read this Bible, it, it wouldn't help me at all. Because I'm looking through a lens that is designed to see there, not designed to see here. The lens through which you look at life is terribly important. Grab the long, wrong lens and, and you'll find yourself full of confusion, full of fear, full of religiosity, full of Pharisaism, full of judgmentalism. Put on the Jesus lens and you'll find yourself open to wonder. You may not know all the answers, but you'll have a lot of questions. And questions always lead to wonder. So let's pray. Holy Spirit, open the eyes of our heart through Jesus to see you, Father, and your love for us. To see you as wonderful, to see ourselves being created and recreated through Jesus as people of wonder. And then seeing others through the lens of wonder. May our whole lives be embraced by wonder and be full of wonder. And thank you, Jesus, that you've opened us up to this. Amen. I think all of us know that uh, there are five senses, five main senses, you know, tasting, feeling, seeing, hearing and touching. Uh, people are telling us uh, neuro neurologists, no neuro whatever, they're telling us there's a whole lot more senses than just those five ones. There's the sense of direction. Um, my wife didn't get that one. Uh, well she actually she did. She got the sense of north, south, east and west but she can't find herself out of a paper bag. I can find my, my way out of anywhere but I, I wouldn't know what west is at 5 p.m. in the afternoon if I was staring at, uh, at the sun. So, you know, we're a good match. There's the sense of, uh, of uh, amazement, they say, and a sense of wonder. You may, you, you may inquire, how come some people tend to see the, the world as half full and some people tend to see it as half empty? And I think that's because some people have put on the lens of wonder. Now, if we take that example of the glass, it actually is half full. No matter what way you look at it, it's not half empty. I mean, because you can't just fill the top half without having filled the bottom half. So the glass is, is half full. And when we look at Jesus, we, we don't just want to live with what we've always known. We don't want to live with what we've just always been told. We don't want to live with just what we've always believed or what we've always done. That was helpful. That has shaped us to who we are today. But we don't want to just camp with who we are today. There's still life to be lived. There's still enjoyment to be had. There's still wonder to be encapsulated by. I don't look back over my life with regret, although there are many things that I do regret. Yeah, I was a pastor in denomination, um, congregations for, for 25 years and I look back over each year and I think, could have I done that differently? Could have I responded in a different way? Or could have I responded instead of reacted? And the answer is always yes. But that's where I was then. And so I don't beat myself up for where I was then. This is where I am today and that's the future that Holy Spirit has for me. So as you engage in this journey of wonder, 
over the next couple of months, it's not a competition or a comparison between where you were and where you're going. It's not that where you have been is bad and, oh, how, how dare that be judged? It's not being judged. It's just no longer where you are. You've had a new discovery. You know, I've always loved my wife. And uh, then one day we went to a marriage encounter weekend. After the marriage encounter weekend, I didn't love her more than I loved her before, but I had a greater awareness. I think I had a richer understanding. I certainly had a different perspective. The love was still there and the commitment was there, but I now knew things that I didn't know. I now had an awareness of things that I wasn't aware of before. And so that meant I could grow and I could serve and I could have a richer view of her and a richer view of our marriage. So that's what we're looking at this morning. We're looking at um, having the perspective of wonder through the lens of wonder, having wonder as our starting point. Because, you know, your starting point determines your outcome. That doesn't mean that if you're born poor, you're going to stay poor. That's not what I mean. I mean, if your starting point is the glass is half empty, then life is going to be pretty much half empty. But if your starting point is, well, the glass is half full, then it's going to be, Holy Spirit, how can you continue to fill me? How can you continue to enrich me? How can you continue to speak to me and to help me to grow? And the first thing I want to share about looking at life through the, the lens of wonder is that wonder grows as you marvel at Jesus. Wonder grows as you marvel at Jesus. In John chapter 14, there's a whole chapter where Jesus basically says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You know, he said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, which doesn't mean there's little rooms and little motel units there. It's a place of remaining and dwelling. Our place is in the Father's heart. And then Jesus says that he's the way, the truth, and the life. He's the way to the Father's heart. He's the truth about the Father. And he's the one who gives the Father's life to us. And then after he said all of that, Philip, one of the twelve, looks at him and says, Jesus, show us the Father. And I'm sure Philip, Jesus must have scratched his head. And he just says it quite plainly. He says, Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so we grow in knowing that we are loved, we grow in knowing that we've got a good father when we look at Jesus and marvel at him. And you know, you can take two groups of people and have two incidents and they will give you totally conflicting reports. It's like a car accident. You know, four people see a car accident and the police come and give the report and, uh, you know, the, the florist and the hairdresser uh, can tell you what... Uh, what what the person looked like after the accident. They can remember details about cuts and abrasion stuff. The, uh, the engineer who was watching can tell you about the, the sharp turn of the wheel. The mechanic can tell you about the tyres that were bald. And, you know, everyone's experience means that you look at things through the perspective of your experience, and it doesn't mean you tell a different tale. It means that you see because of where you've been. So in our Bible reading today, We've got some people who are called the Pharisees. And uh, the Pharisees aren't the bad guys. They just became the bad guys because they were half-glass-empty guys. In, in fact, they made a religion out of being half-glass-empty people. And it says, One day, while Jesus was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting nearby. They had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was on Jesus to heal. And then he heals... And well, firstly, he forgives uh, this guy's sin. And, and straight away, they're there to say, you can't do that. Do you know that's a wonder killer? You can't do that. You're not allowed to do that. You shouldn't do that. Don't sing like that. Don't play like that. You were too loud. You were too soft. You know, wonder killers, they're everywhere. They're in the shopping centre. They're in the car park. They're in my house. They're in the mirror. You know, we can all be wonder killers. Jesus then goes to uh, Matthew's place. Matthew, Matthew has uh, just heard Jesus say, come and follow me. 
And Matthew goes, well, I'm sick and tired of making a life by ripping other people off as a tax collector. Jesus says, follow me. And he goes, wonderful. I wonder what life will look like. There's no prescription. So he gets up and follows. And, and he's amazed. He's found acceptance and love. So he throws a party for all his other tax collector mates. And I'm telling you, if you've been to some of the best Barossa parties or the worst ones, Levi's, Levi's left that for dead. It was a party to end all parties. And there they are, the wonder killers, the Pharisees and the tax collectors, the half glass empty people saying, if only Jesus knew what kind of people these were, he wouldn't be hanging around with tax collectors. He wouldn't be welcoming the bad people of town. And Jesus just tells a little parable. It's, it's a half glass full parable. It's a perspective changer. It's, it's, it's a lens changer. And Jesus says, hey, hey, those who are sick are the ones who need a doctor, not those who are healthy. I haven't come to call the righteous, but I've come to call sinners. And what he didn't say, but what is obvious is, and if I've come to call sinners, then I need to be hanging around with them. They need to see the wonder. <laughs> and you know, people who know their life is bad are open to the wonder. But people who are so full of their own righteousness, they, they don't... They don't see the need for wonder. And so they judge and they criticise and, and they harp on about other people. Now, in, in contrast with these guys is the, um, the four men who brought their mate who was paralysed. Now, what we're not told in the Bible reading is the conversation that went on beforehand. I'll, I'll tell you... I'll tell you something now which I'd love to spend the next half an hour on, but I won't. I'll give it to you in a sentence. Wonder is created through imagination. You know, when little kids are growing up, they, they have imagination. Our three-year-old granddaughter comes over. She's got so many different characters, I can't keep up with them. Said to her the other day, well, little Johnny, what are you doing at Gramps? I'm not little Johnny. I'm Daisy. Oh, she was little Johnny five minutes ago. <laughs> What a beautiful imagination. And then they get to a certain age where they realise people are watching them, usually grandparents with a video, and they clamp down and they shut up and their wonder stops, their imagination is shut down, and then they go to institutions and their imagination is shut down and we never resurrect it again. This book, The Wonder, is to help you resurrect your imagination again. So I'm looking at Luke chapter 5 and I'm imagining. I'm letting my imagination run wild and I'm thinking, these four blokes, four, <laughs> Get their mate who's paralysed and they lower him down through the roof. Who came up with that idea? Just when you're out on your walk next or when you're sitting in your, your recliner chair, just let your imagination run wild. Who put up their hand? Did the other three agree with it straight away? I bet they didn't. Don't be silly. You can't do that. The house is full of people. You're going to wreck old Jim's roof. And where are we going to find four even ropes? Not in your shed. I've been in your shed. It, it's, it's an amazing thing to imagine how that came about. And so you've got the joy killers and the wonder killers, the half glass empty people, trying to shut down everything that's creative, everything that's inventive, everything that's imaginative. And then you've got these four people saying, what's the most creative thing we can come up with to get our mate who's crook to Jesus? Because... We just wonder that Jesus can do something with him. That's the art of possibility. It's not the power of positive thinking, it's the power of positive believing. And the power isn't in your believing, the power is in the one who, in whom you believe. They saw Jesus and they knew in Jesus someone who could do something about their friend's situation. So there was nothing that was going to stop them from getting their friend and Jesus together. What a wonder. The same as Levi. There was nothing that was going to stop Levi from getting him and his tax collector mates together with Jesus. For one, it was digging a hole in a roof and lowering their friend down. For another, it was throwing a party. I wonder what it is for you. But as you let your imagination go wild, as you begin to wonder from the perspective of possibilities, you'll come up with the answers. And they're not written in my book. And they're not in a curriculum. They're in your heart. And they're there already. See, uh, when I left Paravista Lutheran Church in 2009, 
Holy Spirit called us out, but he didn't call us into you know, a successful alternate ministry straight away. I was driving chaser bins, I was doing all kinds of things for a while, and my first day out to uh, Robin and Robin Creeks, Pine Plains, out at uh, Roseworthy, to drive the, the chaser bin, and uh, Robin is already in the header, and they're already late, and the truck's there, and the field bin's there, and the silos are open, and you know what farmers are like when those things line up. And so he puts me in the cab, and it's been many years since I did the tractor, and he said, well, here's, here's a lever. I think this one pulls the, uh, the auger up, and he goes, and he goes oh, no. Um, oh, that one must shut it off then. I think this one lifts it. Oh, look, there's the buttons. You'll find out. And out he hops. And so I try around, and then I get him on the, the what do you call it? It's two-way. Yeah, that thing. And I said, nothing's where he goes, oh, I must have put the hydraulics on wrong. Just keep playing and you'll work it out. Guess what? I did. I reckon that's what Jesus says sometimes. Just keep playing and you'll work it out. But sometimes we go running looking for the rule book. And then we find the rule book doesn't exist. Because Jesus says, yeah, is there a rule? Where does it say in you know, the book of Leviticus, when you have a paralysed mate... And the room is full of people. Dig a hole through someone's roof and lower your friend down. It's not in the law book. It's not in the Old Testament. It's not in the Torah. Where does it say in the Torah, when you come to see the wonder of Jesus, throw the party that will have your neighbours calling the police and invite all of your friends and get them and Jesus in the same room together. That's not written anywhere. That comes out of the creative wonder from someone's heart. Because we learn as we go. When the heart is full of wonder... The strategies follow because the heart will lead the actions. You'll find yourself making more question marks than exclamation marks. Rather than getting together with your kids who don't worship and your grandkids who you'd like to be in church and going, you should be in church on Sunday, exclamation mark, <laughs> you'll find yourself asking questions. How do you cope when you're up against it all? Questions that engage, questions that lead to wonder, questions that lead to conversation, questions that lead to discussion, rather than exclamation marks that lead to statement, shut down, statement, shut down, statement, shut down. I've tried them, they don't work. You know how I know they don't work? I've seen my kids' eyes glazed over. Here, Dad's going on about one of his sermons again. But when I ask them questions, when I inquire, their eyes light up. Dad's interested. He's asking. He's not preaching. He's not teaching. He hasn't got three points with a conclusion. You know. And then when I ask them for a walk, they may start to open up what's happening in their heart. You see, it's not a conversion in a moment. It's a journey over a lifetime. That's what the wonder is all about. So uh, Jesus comes and he says to his disciples, who do people say that I am? Don't you find that an interesting thing? He doesn't come and say, look, listen, this is who I am. And you tell people that. He comes and says, so, who, what are people saying about me? He is so secure that he doesn't really care what they say about him. I mean, he cares about it, but he's, he doesn't take his identity from it. And the disciples say, oh, you could be John the Baptist. You could be uh, Elijah. And then he goes, interesting. Who do you say that I am? And what's Jesus doing? He's engaging and he's getting their imagination going. He's getting them to think for themselves. Not just for how they were told. So, is this being recorded? It is, right? Let's change the names. <laughs> so, we, we had someone in our, in our new community come over for a meal and, and Fred... Fred and I got uh, talking. Fred and I have had a few discussions before. Fred grew up in, in, New, in went to school in New Zealand, and, and uh, I went to school in New Zealand. And uh, Fred went to a Catholic school. And one day, Fred was called into the, the principal, principal's office, the father. Uh, the, that's what they called him, you yeah, know, father. And he goes, Smith, gambling. My neighbour, Fred, goes, no, no, sir. No, no, father, not, not me. Yes, Smith, gambling. Fred says again, no, no, ne never gambling, never gambling, Father. Oh, Fred, gambling. Yes, no, not me. Yes, no, the staff, gambling. Yes, 
Sorry, Father? You say the staff again? Yes, yes, they're all betting that you won't make year 12. (laughs) (laughs) And the reason Fred told me this is he said, um, he started it by saying, Peter, I know you write books and I know you're a Christian. He said, but I've got to say this and I'm sorry to say it. Your beliefs are all about guilt. And then he went to tell me that story. So what had happened to him through his childhood education? Guilt, guilt, and guilt. And now he's only starting to begin to wonder because when he said, your religion is all about guilt, and I said, I'm afraid, I've got to agree with you. I said, not the way it is, but the way we've made it. And he goes, oh, that's not what I expected you to say. I said, it's sad and it's true. I said, yeah, that's why I do what I do now. I write and speak to help people realise that Christianity is not about guilt. You know, some of you, probably many of you, went through confirmation lessons where you had the questions at the end. I heard from a person who was in they did their confirmation through uh, a Christian school and when they got an answer wrong, they got the strap. You want to shut down wonder? And you say, no, we, we don't do that. We don't. No, we don't do it that way, but we do it in other ways. <laughs> by not changing, by being inflexible. And Jesus opens us up to the heart of the Father and releases wonder. You know that verse that was read before? And overwhelming astonishment and ecstasy seized them all. And they recognized and praised and thanked God. And they were filled with and controlled by reverential fear and kept saying, We have seen wonderful and strange and incredible and unthinkable things today. That says Jesus forgave the man's sin and then healed him and sent him on his way. By the way, that's by far the largest point. We're not going to be here till lunchtime. The lens of wonder, it opens you up. So firstly, wonder happens as we look at Jesus. And secondly, the lens of wonder opens you up. It opens you up to possibilities. Uh, I was watching a YouTube video by a bloke called Benjamin Zander. Now, you'll get, you'll get uh, as you read the book, you'll come across Benjamin Zander. But I don't talk about this in the book. Benjamin Zander's there in the chapter that everyone gets an A. Benjamin Zander was the uh, conductor of the of, of Philharmonic Orchestra. And in this video, everyone gets an A, he has two flip charts. And on this flip chart, he talks about the downward spiral. And in classical music, of course, the downward spiral is that all the old people who listen to da- uh, classical music are dying off and the, the younger generation aren't, aren't grabbing it. You know, MTV is capturing all the young people's imagination and, and they don't want to do this. The arts funding is being cut and there's no funding for new um, orchestra training. And, and he said, everywhere you look, there's a downward spiral. And he said, you open up your newspaper and there's a downward spiral. And he said, sports is a downward spiral. He said, you've got losers and winners, but everywhere, every time you've got a loser, there's a downward spiral. And, and I've been thinking about that as I go around and listen to people in, in congregations. You know, I, I think I may have mentioned this here before, that you know, the denomination is dwindling and the younger people aren't attending church services anymore. You know, there aren't any more pastors coming through the seminary, so how are we going to be able to uh, have pastors in the future? These downward spirals. And and there's downward spirals everywhere. And then here's the point that Benjamin Zander made. You can't address the problem in the downward spiral on the same flip chart that represents it. You have to go to a whole brand new flip chart. And this flip chart is called vision or possibility. You see, this is what Jesus did. Jesus came and he said, you know, My father, he gave a covenant and the covenant was that he would be your God and you would be his people and and out of this uh, nation of Israel, you will represent God's heart well to the other nations, but you didn't do that. 
And Jesus said, the situation's got so bad, I, I can't just sort of clean up this old flip chart. I tried that. You know, there was Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, there was Moses, there was David, there were the prophets, there were Jeremiah and Ezekiel and, and Jonah and Nahum and, and, and Habakkuk and all the rest of them. They tried, they came and they said, you know, guys, we've got to turn this around. We're not representing God's heart. And so Jesus says, you know what? That flip chart with its downward spiral, it's, it's just not working. And he says, so what are we going to do? We're going to have a new covenant or a new testament or a new agreement. And this is one where you will have God's spirit within you, not just upon you, but within you. And so as we look at life from the perspective of wonder and possibilities, we see, okay, the downward spiral says, you know, the seminary isn't producing many pastors, you know, woe is... And we look over here at vision and we say, well, I wonder what that means. And you guys are starting to embrace it. You found a resource to come a couple of months. Dennis is on board next week. You've discovered we've got gifts and competencies within our own people. We can organise our own small groups. We can do this. And we say, well, the denominations are declining. You know, how can we turn that around? What if God says, I don't want it turned around? Because with a denomination, you only reach 5% of the society who thinks that denominations are full of, you know, um, well, you know what they think. <laughs> and what if God says, there's a whole new way where, where people will just see me and my heart without the trappings. And they can't blame an institution for their own situation. So we get to look. When we marvel at Jesus and see wonder through him, we then get to look at life through the perspective of wonder. I found this verse in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28 the other day, and it says, you know, do you see what we've got? That's that perspective question. Do you see what we've got? An unshakable kingdom. And do you see how thankful we can be? Not only thankful, but brimming with worship, deeply reverent before God. And so the question is, do you see what we've got? Not, not do you see what we haven't got. I, I, could, I could preach till next year about what we haven't got. That's not going to help any of us. But do you see what we've got? An unshakable kingdom. Do you know the kingdom of God isn't the same as declining worship numbers? The kingdom of God is much bigger. It's much greater. It's like a mustard seed. The smallest of seeds that produces a big tree. Yeah, this is why we read the word, the gospels, again and again, a little bit a day, just so that we can marvel at Jesus and, 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 and uh, concentrate on him. And so we swap and exchange remorse over what hasn't been for wonder over what may be and what might be coming. I reckon that'll do. My final invitation, there's another couple of points, but we'll, we'll give them a miss. My final point is an invitation. It's to ponder wonder. This isn't about you reading a book. It's about pondering wonder. You know, the angel came to Mary and said, greetings, favoured one, the Lord is with you. And uh, it says Mary was deeply troubled by this. And the angel said, you know, don't be afraid. You have found favour with God. And then the next verse says in Luke chapter 1, uh, Luke chap yeah, Luke chapter 1, it says, Mary pondered this in her heart. To ponder is to reflect, to mull over. It's not to come up with the answers. It's not to know everything. But it's to go, I wonder. What if? How about? Could it be? Is it possible? Surely not. Just imagine. My goodness. Aren't they beautiful phrases? I learned that from my wife. I'm very, very quick with a judgment. And she just goes, I wonder what's behind that. And so as you read, I love what Chris said before. You know, read with a highlighter, read with a pen. And when you get together, I was telling someone this the other day, and they said, oh, someone, a pastor or something, I can't remember where I was, and they said, oh, can you just say those again? And they wrote them down. And it was, read a chapter, 
which has got four or five sections in it. And when you come together, or when you get on the phone, say, what was the favourite thing that you read? What was something that really stood out for you? What was something that has the potential to change you? What were the things that confused you or that you'd like to dig deeper into? You know the good thing about that, there's no right or wrong answer. So you read, you ponder, and you share. You're enriched by someone else's sharing, and they're enriched by your sharing, and that's how you grow together, and that's how you grow deeper. When we were in Tasmania, uh, not last year, the year before, my dad knew he was dying, and it was my brother's 60th, so he treated us all to a trip to Tassie. After Dad came back home, Julie and I went on a little uh, excursion and we ended up at the treetop walk at Tahuni. Heights and me have never been best friends, especially as I get older. But Julie was so excited, like a little kid, I, I didn't want to destroy it for her. And as we walked towards it from about 100 metres away, I said, I'm going to focus on this air bridge and this air walk. And so I looked at the girders. I looked at the expanse of the steel. I looked at the struts that were coming down the side. And then as we walked past, we walked past one of the huge steel ropes. And I realised that that steel rope is made up of about 10 steel ropes, each of which is made up of a thousand little fibres of steel. And I looked at the way that they were attached to these pins and the way they were bolted into the ground. And I studied the structure and I studied the strength of it. And then I contemplated with gratitude that we live in Australia, where engineers don't just win their degree in a cornflakes packet, but they've actually studied and they know what they're on about and that this has been tested again and again and again. And we got to it and Julie says, how do you feel? And I said, I feel fine. And halfway through she said, you seem okay with this. I said, I've never felt better. And we got to the end and I said, that was an amazing experience. And I realised that's what I'm inviting you to do. You can focus on the half glass empty. You can focus on the fear. You can focus on the height. You can focus on the drop between you and the ground. Or you can look at Father God and his heart. Study his faithfulness. How true he's been. How reliable he is. Investigate his constancy. And as you go deeper into his heart, you'll find as we sing, and the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. As you ponder, you'll see clearly through the lens of wonder. And now I need all the kids up the front here with me, please, if you want to come up the front. You don't have to, but you can. Well, you can do it from where you are. You want to do it from where you are. You don't have to come up the front, you can do it from there. What I want each of you kids to do, this is going to be really, really strange, okay? I want you to put a hand over your dad's eye and one over your mum might have to lift her glasses up, okay? Can you do that? Over dad's eye and over mum's eye. You see, kids look at the world through wonder and imagination, so let's pray. Father, as these kids bless their parents, we pray that the imagination from these kids goes into their parents. Thank you, Jesus. And Jesus, you asked each of us to become like little children, not to be childish, but to become like little children, full of wonder, imagination, playfulness, inventiveness. I reckon those four blokes were full of childlike imagination. How can we get our friend to Jesus? So Jesus, with the authority we have in you, we say no to downward spiral thinking. In fact, I'm going to ask you to pray that out loud after me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we say no to the power of downward thinking. We know it exists, but it does not determine our future. You, Jesus, are our future because you are our past and our present. And so we say yes, Jesus, in your name to wonder, 
to being fascinated by you, to living full in the Father's heart, even as you did. We receive you a fresh Holy Spirit to create fascination and wonder deep within us. And we pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. You know, one of the things I do when um, we've got eight grandkids and if I'm reading something in the Bible, just ask the grandkids, what do you see in this? It's amazing because it's so different what I see. They'll, you know, engage with that. Let it run rampant in you. And we've got a song, is that right? Yeah, let's all stand, please. I learned this, um, I get to travel around a bit, and uh, this one church I go to, they do this, stand and, and face the room somewhere, because we're going to bless each other. And place your hands up, why should just one person bless? And uh, as you do, look around, say, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you. And be, gracious to you. and be gracious to you. Let's not forget those upstairs. The Lord look on you with favour. And, and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. And now stay standing please. So Jesus said to uh, Levi, come and follow me. And Levi began an adventure of wonder. He didn't know where it was going to take him. That wasn't his concern. His concern wasn't where it's going to go. His concern was who was calling me. And so all he had to do was follow Jesus. And Jesus did the worrying about where it was going to go. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. Where you move, I'll move. I will follow. Who you love, I love How you serve, I love 
drinking this morning tea, is that correct? Anybody nodding their head? There usually is, so you can head out there and um, I'll take the books over if anybody wants to grab a copy of the book this morning. So um, have, a great, have a great week. God's, and if anybody wants prayer, yeah, um, feel free to come down here or approach somebody else. Uh, we can all pray with one another. Don't hesitate to ask, but um, Peter's available to pray. Uh, I'll pray. There's other people amongst you who will pray with you if you've got a need today. Go in God's peace and grace. Amen.